I will be reading from Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, The wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and so are the skins. But no one puts new wine, but one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. This is the word of the Lord. Here I stand. I can do no other. When Martin Luther said that, or something like that, he was standing before Johann Eck, a leading Catholic thinker in the area, at a large gathering called the Diet of Worms. Not the Diet of Worms, that would be gross and despicable. The Diet of Worms. Before that point, Luther had been a relatively obscure monk in a small German town called Wittenberg. But when he became convinced that the Catholic Church was in desperate need of reform, he posted his 95 theses on the doors of the cathedral, which was something of the ancient version of a bulletin board, and he became a local hero in Germany. Word trickled back to the Pope. Before long, when he refused to recant, Luther was excommunicated from the church and had to stand trial at the Diet of Worms. Eck chided Luther, saying, Do you know better than all the Christians who have ever lived? Are all the Christians who've ever gone before you wrong and you alone right? Is it just you who knows right, Martin? And he accused Luther of destroying the church's witness. Wait till the Muslims and the Jews hear about this. A, a Christian monk saying the church has got it all wrong. You're ruining our witness. Until finally Luther said, I will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. Or something like that. And the Protestant Reformation was underway and the world continues to feel the effects of it today. Before all was said and done, the church was splintered in innumerable denominations with different understandings of Scripture and baptism and communion and salvation and the relationship between church and state. This wasn't just a moment in history. This was a history-making moment. Over the last few months, I have asked the deacons to join me in reading a book entitled The Great Emergence by Phyllis Tickle, who argues that about every 500 years, the church has what she calls a giant theological rummage sale. From Gregory the Great and the rise of the monastic movement around 500 AD, to the Great Schism in 1060 that divided the Roman Catholic Church in the West from the Greek Orthodox Church in the East, to around 1500 with Luther and the Protestant Reformation. And if you fast forward 500 more years, you arrive somewhere around today. In this book, Tickle argues that reform isn't something that happens once and for all for the church, but the church is always in constant need of reform. We are reformed and always reforming. And when there are seismic shifts in the world, the church must respond to them. For Luther, the cultural shifts of his day involved the rise of the printing press. What sense would it make to call people's attention to Scripture, 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 which is what Luther wanted to do, if people don't have Bibles? It was the rise of the printing press that allowed Luther to, to say that and do that. The rise of nationalism in his day. The Roman Empire was crumbling and you had the rise of nation-states. And a Catholic church who had increased the sale of indulgences in that day in order to fund the great crusades. And in so doing, they were taking money from peasant people in places like Germany 
who had just survived plagues and famines, and for these folks to be sending money to Rome, it just left a bad taste in their mouth. A church that is engaging as a witness in the world must adapt to a changing world. And I don't need to remind you today that our world is changing at warp speed. Social media, the way Google uh, in, impacts your search for information. A few weeks ago I heard a lecture at Arkansas Baptist College talking about the algorithms of Google that monitors every click you make on your computer, every click. They know what you like and they know what you don't like. And so you can Google anything. And Google doesn't just show you the facts. Google has the algorithms of the things you like. And that's what shows up on your screen. It's not the equivalent of an encyclopedia. And it's a new thing for our day. A brand new thing. To medical advancements impacting the end of life. To forms of birth control influencing the beginning of it ever-changing science and anthropological studies, a culture in which authority and institutions are questioned de facto, and you have a church trying to navigate some pretty tenuous waters. It's a new day. However, we also follow one who called his people to recognize their times and discern them well, to discern the work of God around them. In Mark chapter 2, the disciples of the Pharisees and the disciples of John the Baptist are questioning why Jesus' disciples don't fast. In response, Jesus retorted that it, was, it wasn't the right time to fast. This is more like a wedding than a funeral, he says. Weddings are a time for feasting, not fasting. But you have to know which is which. You have to know your context. You have to interpret your times. Likewise, you don't sew a patch of new cloth upon an old garment. Otherwise, the patch, because it's new, will shrink and will rip away from the old garment and it'll leave a, a, a larger tear than the original one. And you don't put new wine in old wineskins, Jesus says. In, in Jesus' day, they stored their wine in leather bags, wineskins. As the grape juice fermented over time, it spread. And therefore, the wineskins had to spread. They had to be elastic with the wine. But if you put new wine into old wineskins that had lost their elasticity, the wineskins would burst. You would ruin the wineskins and the wine. Jesus is saying here that the old ways of doing things cannot contain the newness of the kingdom of God that Jesus was bringing into the world then and there. It was a new day. You see the Bible do this over and over and over again. Update the tradition. Sabbath. Circumcision. Food laws. The way Scripture is to be read rightly. Over and over again, reform is built into the fabric of our Scriptures and that's the way we're walking today. So today, on the heels of commemorating the 500th anniversary of Luther's theses, months of talking about the history of it and the theology of it here in this church, I want to make some proposals to you today about necessary reforms in our church and the church. These proposals come after an extended season of listening and discerning and studying and praying and I hope they'll be received as such. We had this dangling Sunday between the season of Thanksgiving and Advent, which begins next Sunday, and we thought this would be a good time to really think about how the Reformation continues to impact our congregation. I hope that this sermon will carry with it lengthier conversations that one sermon cannot fulfill. First of all, just as Luther called the Catholic Church to rethink its views of salvation, it seems to me that we would be wise to do the same today. For many Christians today, evangelicals in particular, salvation is something that happens instantaneously, involving our souls and only our souls, and it's chiefly about heaven and hell. This idea of salvation is the direct inheritance we've received from the revivalism of the Great Awakenings in this country. What I'm saying is it's context-specific. 
Most Christians who don't live in this country or have lived in other times before the Great Awakening did not look at salvation the way many Christians look at it today. In the Bible, however, salvation is not instantaneous, even if there are watershed moments. It is not strictly spiritual, and it's not otherworldly. Salvation is a journey. It involves the stuff of this life in this world. And the Bible commends a very physical faith to us. A God who created the physical world and who came to us with a very real human body, who was raised bodily from the dead, whose chief symbols are water and bread and wine. This is a physical faith. Every time we partake of communion, it's not that we spiritualize the bread. It's that we bread eyes our spirituality. We remind ourselves that our faith is caught up in the stuff of life. Salvation has to do with our souls, to be sure, but also with the stuff of life. Salvation is something that can be visible in this world, even as it is invisible. And there is part of me that understands the appeal of the heaven-hell matrix. I get it. On the one hand, fear is an incredible short-term motivator. Scaring people works. If nothing about Jesus appeals to you, I could stand up here and just scare, you, scare the hell out of you, and it would work. If you pull the heaven and hell pin out of much Christian thought today, it doesn't compute. Because it's all about heaven and hell. It, it's more about heaven and hell than Jesus. I also understand the appeal of the heaven and hell scheme because it divides people into two camps. It makes it nice and neat. There's no either or. There's good and bad, black and white, heaven and hell. Baptists don't have much room for purgatory. And it just makes everything nice and neat, scary and neat. But while fear is a powerful short-term motivator, it is horrible at long-term character development. Its focus is on getting you out of hell, but it's impotent to get the hell out of you. And when people see salvation as only the end game, what's missed is the journey. The cross becomes a source of our salvation, something Jesus did for us. But it, it's not seen in this mindset as the pattern of our lives, something we're called up to take as well. How many times did Jesus say, take up your cross and follow me? In other words, the cross wasn't just something Jesus did, but something to which we are all called. When people see salvation as only about the end game, they miss how they are being shaped into the image of Christ. One of the problems with churches of our stripe today is, is the focus has been so geared towards otherworldly, spiritual, eternal things that the faith has nothing to say about the here and the now. We've lost our public moral witness. Today, we need a more robust idea of salvation that is this worldly, communal, and it involves a journey. Along similar lines, we have to recognize the communal and systemic nature of things. One of my favorite writers says, to call a human an individual is a contradiction in terms. To call a human an individual is a contradiction in terms because not one of us is an individual. We have multiple spheres of belonging and all of those spheres shape who we are. We live connected and interconnected lives in a larger web of being. Which is why conversations about souls and systems are interrelated conversations. There's a dynamic uh, synergy between our souls and our systems, they impact each other. Last summer, some of you might remember, we had a guest speaker visit our Sweet Justice series. He's a friend of mine named Jason Coker. He runs CBF in Mississippi. He also oversees Together for Hope on a national scale, the Rural Poverty Initiative uh, in which we're engaged in Helena. While Jason was with us, he retold the famous story 
of the boy who's walking with his father down a beach while the beach is littered with, um, you know, sea stars and that sort of starfish. Sea stars? <laughs> starfish. The boy's picking up one, picking up another, throwing them back into the sea. And his dad says to him, Do you see how many starfish? are on this beach. Do you think you're making any difference? And the boy looked at the one in his hand and he said, well, it, it makes a difference to this one. And he threw it back in the sea. Jason said he told that story once around one of his friends who knows about this kind of stuff, a science-oriented guy. And he said, you know that when starfish have crawled upon a beach like that, it's because the water is toxic and lacks oxygen enough for them to live in it. And that's why they crawled out on the beach to the first place. And so throwing one into the water is to throw one back to its own demise. When you throw the starfish back in, brothers and sisters, you have to know something about the water. Sometimes I think the church in the West is so individualistic that we're only focused on saving one starfish. And that's good and right. But we also have to monitor the water. We failed to cultivate a communal consciousness. All the while, the gospel writers, when they summarize the preaching of Jesus, they say, He came preaching the kingdom of God. Not just hearts and souls, but the kingdom of God. Did you know that in Hebrew, the word for righteousness and justice is the same word? The word for righteousness... And justice is the same word. Let me give you a good example of the way this works in our lives. When we think of racism today, most often we think of racism as something individual people do. Bad people. They do it consciously. They burn crosses and wear masks and say ugly words. It's something individuals decide to do. But when I listen to the black community today, what I hear them saying is that racism is not just something that individuals consciously do. It's something built into our systems in which we all participate. You don't have to burn crosses in people's yards when you pass policies that ignore the cross that have the same effect on people's lives. When you can do in policy what you used to do overtly and in front of people, it has the same destructive effect. What I'm saying to you today is, if we put all of our focus on starfish but ignore the water, we miss the whole point of things. Which brings us to an ever-perplexing intersection of church and state. One of the most seminal beliefs of Martin Luther was his views of two kingdoms the belief which later became the forebear of separation of church and state, was the idea that the church and the state composed two separate kingdoms. The church operated under the authority of the gospel and was to be totally nonviolent. The state operated under the authority of the law and could use violence if necessary. It's why when the peasants revolted after Luther, he said that they were wrong to violently revolt, but the state wasn't wrong to violently act upon their revolting. When Luther's view of two kingdoms is joined to his seething anti-Semitism in his later years, he was no angel by the way, you have a state completely free from the moral conscience of the church with a detestable view of the Jewish people. Now let's put that in a bowl and mix it together, right? A dehumanizing view of Jewish people, which Luther held in his later years. And the idea that the church and the state are totally and utterly separable and are to act on their own with no influence over the other. If you put all that into a bowl and put it into an oven for a couple of centuries, I wonder what could happen given those ingredients. I often ask myself, how could the churches of Germany say nothing? How could they participate? How could they be complicit in it? The fact is, most of them were blind to it. 
And this is part and parcel to the things in which we're participating today. When you remove faith from politics, you get godless politics. Now, I want to be clear today about what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. Alright, so hear me well. I wholeheartedly believe in the traditional Baptist view of the separation of church and state. Wholeheartedly. I hope you do too. That the machinery of the state and the machinery of the church should never be mixed. I don't think it's a good idea for public tax dollars to be funneling inside sectarian organizations, no matter who they are, even us. I don't want the government's money in this place. I also don't believe the machinery of the church and the machinery of the state should commingle. I don't think the governor of Arkansas should be choosing our pastors and staffs and that kinds of stuff. I believe the church should not campaign for certain candidates. And there's actually a work today to do away with the Johnson Amendment that would allow churches to encourage and support candidates who are running for office. That's a bad idea. If you support candidates out in the world, you give to organizations that are tax taxed. If churches become lobbyist organizations, people can give their tax-free donations to the church, which becomes, in short, a lobbyist organization. It is toxic and bad, and it has no place here. However, I also want to be clear that there is a ditch on the other side of the road. The separation of church and state does not equate to the separation of faith and public life, or faith and public policy. It does not mean that the church has nothing to say about systemic injustice. Yes, we are called to care for each starfish, but we're also asked to monitor the water, to ask why are the starfish up here in the first place. The church has to rediscover its public witness in the world. I have heard people say, focus on social justice, you know, is a distraction from the gospel. But it's only a distraction to the people who believe that social justice has no part in the gospel. Social justice, the way we organize our lives together, the way we treat each other, the way our systems work, whether fairly or unfairly, has something to do with how we love our neighbors or don't. It's part and parcel to our faith. I am not saying that the church should be partisan. Brothers and sisters, I don't believe the names in the Lamb's Book of Life have a D or R out beside them. What does God care about, Republican or Democrat? Over the last several weeks, with all the sexual abuse scandals in both parties, I've been reminded of our need for a justice and a righteousness that transcends party. Neither party has a monopoly on vice, and neither party has a monopoly on virtue. What are partisan concerns to a church that is global and cosmic? The church uh, is called to have a Lord, to follow a Lord, not an elephant or a donkey. But nonpartisan does not mean non-public. The church is unequivocally called to be a voice in the public arena, protecting the vulnerable, providing for those in need, creating systems of equity and fairness and responsibility, and telling the truth. It's part of this church's history to do that. We remember that every time we give out a Brooks Hayes Award. A faith that is real and robust is what I'm calling for today. Not a civil religion that hollows out the essence of the faith in order to buttress a position. I'm not talking about a religion that turns prayer into good theater, but empties it of its transformative power. I'm not talking about a religion that wants to construct Ten Commandment monuments here, there, and everywhere while trampling on the commands with ever-increasing ubiquity. What I am talking about is a faith that speaks truth to power because our allegiance is to a higher power still. A faith that is, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, the conscience of the state. Where we are a servant to all and a slave to none. A faith that is real and robust and that recognizes that righteousness and justice are the same word. Finally, I believe the church can and must recenter itself on the center of our faith. 
Every week when you depart from this room, I give you the same benediction. I know it's monotonous and laborious and boring to some of you. But I do it anyway. Because I believe part of the reformation of the church is recentering ourselves on what is at the center. In essence, the Christian faith is about relationship. When you and I were baptized, we were not baptized into a church or a doctrine or an idea or a creed. We were baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You and I were baptized into a relationship with God who as Trinity is relationship. The highest expression of faith is not certainty, but love. Love for God, love for neighbor, our neighbors who are like us and our neighbors who are not. And it seems to me that a good number of evangelicals today look at faith and love as opposites. Different, different spheres. I, I would love these folks, but my faith... Faith and love are, are viewed as polar ends of the spectrum somehow. And yet, many times our faith causes us to hurt others and harm others. Over the last several weeks, I've seen people use faith, Scripture even, to justify sexual abuse, to justify misogyny, to justify cutting off a relationship with a gay grandson. But brothers and sisters, I want to say to you today that that dichotomy of faith over here and love over here is bad framing. It's bad framing. And it's not the way Jesus embodied the kingdom in His, in His day or ours. Our faith leads us to build relationships, not break them. To, to lean into our neighbor, not run away from them. To cause human flourishing, not human destruction. Relationships with others do not blur our view of the truth. Relationships with others are the truth. Loving God and loving others isn't an, an excuse for lazy thinking, but the highest expression of Christian thinking. It is our basic posture for interpreting Scripture, for determining what is the common good, for the way we interact with people who disagree with us. Might I suggest to you today that if you take all the conflicts between Jesus and the Pharisees and boil them down into what are they really fighting about, what Jesus and the Pharisees were really arguing about was a basic posture towards how to read Scripture. One which causes human flourishing and one which observes the letter of the law even if it kills the spirit of it. The church of the future will be an academy for transforming love. It will change us. The church is where we learn to practice the mystery of love where we learn to forgive, where we learn to show grace, where we learn to share a roof with people who do not see it the way we see it. The church is the academy where that happens. If the church fails there, the church fails. If the church succeeds there, we will succeed no matter what else it is we fail at. To be sure, the church has some incredible challenges before us. You know that and I know that. And every time you drive past a church of any stripe today, you know that. You can see it. A pluralistic culture means that oftentimes we don't share basic assumptions with other people. So how do we have conversations when we don't share basic assumptions? A hyper-partisan win-at-all-cost politics makes gospel proclamation very tricky. A moment of preacher confession this morning. I hope you'll hear this in the right spirit. From my chair, it seems like that one person's morality is another person's politics. And one person's politics is another person's morality. I could stand up here today and say, as God's people, we are called to welcome the stranger and the alien. And everyone in here would amen that, I suspect. But when it gets to the, the how and the why when it gets into the policy of it. And yet that is a very fine line. When does morality become politics and when is politics morality? 
I would ask you to struggle with that with me. Because the hyper-partisanship today makes gospel proclamation about anything public really tricky. Maybe that's a way we can show some grace to each other and recognize how hard it is to be a Christian today. How hard it is to speak publicly today when the air we're breathing feels partisan. We live in a day where people mistrust anything institutional and authoritative. And that means churches in general and church leaders in particular start with a deficit of trust. We have some incredible challenges before us. But brothers and sisters, I also believe that there are incredible opportunities before us. What a time to be alive! What a time to be the church! There is new wine awaiting us. God's hope, peace, and love await us. But this new wine will not fit in our old wineskins, I assure you. And if we try to force it, we'll likely lose both the wine and the wineskins. But to a church that is alive to this future, to a church that knows the difference between times of fasting and feasting, to a church who's willing to try some new wineskins, the future is awaiting. And it will be delicious and good and satisfying and beautiful. Really beautiful. Here I stand. I can do no other. I hope you'll stand with me. In a moment, we're going to have a time of response, and I'm going to ask you to do something a little different today. Not to stand, but to remain seated just for a moment, and to pray for our church, to pray for our staff, to pray for our leaders, to pray for our community, for our missions, for our worship, for our discipleship, for your Sunday school teacher for our neighbors in downtown Little Rock, for our city, for Helena, for South Africa, just to pray, to lift someone up. Would you join me as we have a time of prayer?